Yeah, so uh, I hope everybody had a good Christmas, and I hope you got the present that you wanted after you returned it for the one you got, right? <laughs> yeah, and then uh, just a couple of days is New Year's, right? And, uh, and it's the time that we all look forward to, the time that we uh, uh, carry forth that annual tradition of making a New Year's resolution, right? Everybody made their New Year's resolution already? You know what it's going to be. Uh, most of us have something in mind. If you need some help, then uh, maybe uh, you can do what a lot of people in the church do. They make a resolution to read the whole Bible all the way through in the, in the year. Right? Have you ever made that? Have you ever done it? Yeah, yeah, some of you. Uh, some people make a, a, a New Year's resolution just to set aside some time each morning to spend that time with God in prayer, uh, reading scripture, reading some kind of book that will help them uh, get closer to God. Some people make a New Year's resolution to be, uh, be more intentional about their prayer life and that they would uh, pray for some very specific requests. Maybe it's, it's for peace in the world, right? And in our country, maybe it's for a loved one that has strayed. Maybe uh, it's a, a missionary that's really close to us and we know personally. So we, we just really, we make this resolution every morning. I'm going to pray for this person. Uh, I'm going to pray for our church and that our church will be blessed and be, continue to be used by God to bring people into the kingdom. I know uh, growing up in, uh, in Sunday school, uh, I remember the first of the year, uh, we always got these little boxes of envelopes. Y'all remember those? Yeah, some of you probably remember those. We got them for Sunday school, and uh, on every, uh, my mother, grandmother would get one, one of those boxes. She didn't actually, wasn't physically capable of going to church. She was born in the 1880s. So by this, by this 1960s, she wasn't able to go uh, physically, but she still got that little box, and she would uh, put her tithe in there, and she would check off these little boxes that's on there and give it to me, and I would take it to church and turn it in for her. On those envelopes, there was these places that you could check these boxes, uh, like brought your Bible, check, you know, studied lesson, check, uh, invited a friend, check. Uh, brought an offering, check. Going to stay for worship service, check. And so uh, I remember that when I get that box at the beginning of the, every year, uh, I would always make this, this pledge, this, this uh, resolution that I would fill those out every single week, right, for the whole year. And uh, I don't think I ever did it, you know. I don't think I've ever actually made it all the way through the whole year. Something would come up and I'd miss a Sunday or, uh, or like today, I would forget my Bible and have to use a pew Bible, right? I was thinking of all the Sundays, why would I, today be the day that I forgot my Bible, right? But, uh, so, uh, but something would always come up. And, I, and I'm pretty sure that something comes up a lot of times with many of us when we make New Year's resolutions. Does that ever happen to y'all? You make a resolution and then somewhere along the way it just kind of falls apart. Well, one of the reasons I think that people's resolutions fall apart, especially when it comes to, to resolutions dealing with church, is this. Okay? Uh, we make a pledge, a, a, a resolution with, with every single intent in the world to, to keep it, but then we don't. And, and like we, we say we're going to read the Bible and we're going to pray and, and we sit and we read and we pray and we sit and we read and we pray and we sit and we read and we pray. But after a while, if we don't do anything with that, if we don't put that into action, if we don't use it, then it becomes kind of like, what's the point? What's the point? You know? If all you're going to do in the morning is sit and read and pray and sit and read and pray and sit and read and pray, but then never do anything with what God has given you and God is putting inside you, if you never take that out into the world and use it, then what's the point? And after a while, we, you know, it just kind of starts fading away and, and we forget about it until next December 31st, and then we start all over, right? Yeah. 
So today, I want to tell you about something that you can do that will, actually, it's what we're supposed to do. And, and uh, whenever we sit and read and pray and sit and read and pray, what are we supposed to do with that? And how can we use that to go out and be and, and put it to use the way God has intended? And for this, I'm going to use uh, Romans, uh, Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 26 through 31. Before we read that, though, I want to tell you something about this. So the book of Romans, Paul wrote this, uh, and his intention before he wrote, when he wrote it, was he was going to go to Spain. And he was going to stop off in Rome on his way to Spain. And so he was writing this letter to the people in Rome, to the church in Rome, so that he kind of would introduce himself and his theology before he went. Of course, he got to go there a couple of years later, but he never made it to Spain because he died in Rome, right? So the book of Romans is really, it's like theology 101. If, if you want to know the basic theology and principles of Christianity, then you read the book of Romans, and, and you pretty much have it. And Paul starts off with, at the very beginning, he, he talks about, you know, everybody should know God. You, could, you should be able to look at the trees outside and look at nature and know without a doubt that there's a God. The problem is people turn their back on God. And when they turn their back on God, there's consequences. Things happen because people turn their backs on God. And so these consequences uh, uh, of turning your back on God uh, are not, doesn't turn out too good for us, right? But thanks be to God, this is Paul writing in the book of Romans. He writes that, that God knows this, and we've all done it. We've all fallen short. We've all turned our back on God at some point. But God has provided us a way to be reunited with God in spite of us turning our back, and that's through Jesus Christ. And then he gets, when we get to chapter 8, he talks about some of the benefits of accepting Christ into your life. Okay? So that, this is, I'm trying to set this up. What we talk about today is one of the benefits you have, the resources you have available to you, as a Christian, once you've accepted Christ and Christ is in, is, is in part of your life. Y'all got it? All right. We're going to talk about what we're going to do with what God gives us, and we're going to talk about some of the benefits of, of, what God, of having Christ in our life. Before we read it, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we ask now that you open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. So that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, that we can hear with joy what you say to us today. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. So this is Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 31. It says this. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? This is the word of God. For the people of God, thanks be to God. So here's a question for you. Have you ever had an experience in your life uh, where you were at the right spot at the right time, right, to help somebody? 
Uh, maybe uh, you're going down the road and somebody's broke down on the side of the road and you're able to stop and help them. Uh, I used to carry in my truck a jack and a, a four-way lug wrench, a jug of water, uh, some jumper cables, and I would just go down the road looking for people who were broke down on the side of the road and so that I could stop and help them. And then we would always get the conversation around to church and that kind of a deal. Uh, have you ever done that? Yeah. Uh, have you ever just been in, the, like, in a grocery store and you come across somebody you know and, and you just, hey, how's it going? And you start talking to them and they open up to you and tell you that something's going on in their life, that some kind of uh, uh, crisis is going on in their life and you just happen to be there to be able to talk to them and pray to them about it or pray with them about it. Well, a lot of people would call those kinds of things coincidences it was a coincidence that you just happened to be going down the road at the same time that they needed help it's a coincidence that you were at the store at the same time that these people came in and they were talking but for us as Christians we wouldn't call them a coincidence we call them divine appointments we would say that God intended for us to be at that point at that time for that person to help that person a divine appointment so what I want to talk to you about this morning is, is six, they're not really steps, but six things that goes on for people to, uh, to make these uh, divine appointments happen, okay? We're going to be using the scripture from Romans uh, chapter 8 to kind of follow along through that. The first one I call is, is called a call to action, right? Uh, there's something that's going on and there's a call to action. Somebody needs help. So uh, in verse 26, it said, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep our words. So have you ever been in a crisis, and whenever uh, something that's happened in your life, maybe somebody's passed away, maybe you've got a diagnosis that's just overwhelming, uh, maybe uh, you've got a test that you've got to take and you haven't studied for it, or what? who knows? You know, something's going on in your life that we could define it as a crisis. Has anybody ever had something like that? Usually, usually when we're in a crisis, we're, we become emotionally, physically, spiritually incapable of, of, of moving forward. And so uh, the Holy Spirit is there to intercede on our behalf in those instances, in those times that we can't, uh, we can't operate and function the Holy Spirit, God, is there for us to intercede on our behalf and make sure that you get the help that you need. Step two, or consideration number two, uh, is that God will orchestrate other people to be put into your life to help you through whatever crisis is going on. In verse 27, it says, And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. God searches the hearts of the people, of other people, to see who is equipped and who's ready to respond to help to someone in crisis. So just picture this. You have somebody who's in a crisis and they need help. So God is going to, the Holy Spirit is going to be there for them. And so God starts searching, you know, all over the place. And he's looking for somebody, just the right person, right? And he searches that person's heart, and he knows them, and he says, ah, there's one. I'm going to orchestrate this thing to make this person come in contact with this person. Y'all get that picture? All right. Step three. God has already been preparing and given the ability to this person to help the one in crisis. This is pretty cool. This is pretty cool. God, it says in verse 28, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Okay? God goes ahead of time Ahead of way ahead of time of that person that needs help and he prepares the way for them to get the help so that everything will work out, OK? 
okay, for the person in the crisis. And God calls this person, equips them, has already got them in a position that they are able to help. And then he sends them on the mission to meet and help this person. Y'all see how this works? Somebody's in crisis. They need help. They are emotionally, physically, just spiritually drained. They cannot help themselves. They're in that position. And so the Holy Spirit intercedes on their behalf. God has already given people uh, the ability to help them. And now he starts orchestrating and moving them into the position to help that other person. Step four. Here's the deal. God knows you. God knows your abilities. God knows exactly what you have the ability to do. God knows where you've been, what you've lived through, the crisis that you have lived through, and God knows that you are the person who is equipped to help the one in crisis. All right? Verses 29 and 30 says, For those whom he foreknew... He predestined them to be conformed to the image of, of his son. So that, y'all remember what Jesus did, right? Jesus had divine appointments all the time. He just happened to show up at the right place for the woman at the well, right? He just happened to show up uh, at the right time for the, the crippled guy. He just, y'all get it? Jesus has predestined and he's ordered your life so that you can be moved and called and put in a position to help others just like Jesus did. Here's a way that you might can think about it. In the military, uh, the leader of, of a, a particular group or unit is given some uh, tasks to accomplish, okay? Maybe that one leader is given the task to go build a bridge somewhere. Maybe that same leader is also given the task to go blow up a bridge somewhere else. Maybe that same leader is given a task to go and provide medical care to this group of people over here. Maybe that same leader is given tasks to go and provide support for all of these people. Y'all get it? So the leader, he knows, once he's given the task, he knows who, who is the best person to build a bridge. Who the people I have is the best one that can build a bridge. Who is the best one that I have who can go blow a bridge up? Who is the best one that I have of all the people I have? Who is the best one that can go, go provide medical care? Of all the people I have, who is the best one that can uh, provide support for all these people? And based on the knowledge that he has of the people he has available, he can appoint them to the appropriate task. You see how that works? God does the exact same thing. God has predestined us. He has given us certain abilities to be able to go and do what he calls us to do at the time that we're needed to do it. Some people have uh, the ability to, to go and build things. Some people have the ability to go and manage projects. Some people have the ability to go and make money. Some people have the ability to support all of them. That's the way this thing works. God gives us all abilities and, and, and the, the resources and the practice and the experience we need to go and do what he's called us to do. So this consideration or step number five is this. And it's the first part of verse 31. It says, what then are we to say about these things? What are you going to do with it? How are you going to respond to what God is calling you to do? Did you know that there's people in crisis all over the place and that God uses us to reach out and help them? And this is the way it works. It, they, they are emotionally, physically, spiritually drained so that they can't help themselves. The Holy Spirit's going to intercede. The Holy Spirit has predestined you, given you ability to go and do the things that, you, that he needs you to do. God is going to call you and to go and do what he needs to do, done to help this person in crisis. The question is, on verse 31, how are you going to respond? You know, 
Are you going to stop uh, going down, when you're going down the road and you see the person broke down? Are you going to stop? Are you going to respond? And you're, in the, and you're in the store and you see somebody and you talk to them and they start talking and just pouring things out. You're just oh, I need to get out of here. Are you going to sit there and listen? How are you going to respond? Think about what abilities do you have? What has God placed in your life? What abilities do you have? And how has the training and experiences you've had throughout life enabled you to be called on God to be used? How will you respond to what God's calling you to do? Here's another part of this, the last one, six. Consideration number six. You're not going to do this thing by yourself. You don't have to worry about it. God is always going to be there with you, right? In, in verse 31, the second part of it, it says, if God is for us, who can be against us, right? If God has predestined you and given you the abilities to go and help somebody, if you have practiced and honed those skills so that you can be the very best person God's called you to be for what God's called you to do, there's no need to fear because God is there with you. And if God is with you, God will, there's no, nobody can come against you in this. Here's an example of how this thing kind of works. There was a lady here that was a member of our church. She's uh, Right after her son was killed in a car wreck, and right after that, her and her husband moved to another town. But, but while she was here, while she was here, I got an email or a phone call from her every day, almost every day, about a prayer request that she would have for somebody. And it would always start out like this. I was at Dollar General, and uh, this, I met this lady, a stranger, and she started talking to me, and she's on hard times, and we really need to pray for her, and her name is, can we add her to the prayer list? The next day, it's like, I was at Kroger, and I came across this college student, and she really looked down, so I went up to her, and I just, you know, you look, you look down. And the girl just started pouring it out, and can we pray for her? And here's her name. This is the way it works. You make yourself available to be used by God in those crises to help people. God says, you're in a crisis. You need help. He searches. Where is somebody that can help this person? Oh, there they are. There they are. Yeah. I've, I've given them the abilities to do this. I have orchestrated their life so that they can go and help this person. Now let's just get them in that, get them in that position. So you're going down the road and you're on the way and the traffic is blocked. And you say, Dang, come and get out of the way. Maybe other things than that, some people might say. But instead of saying that, what if, oh, I wonder who God is maneuvering me to meet. And you start praying for that, that divine appointment and he just needs you to slow down because you are going to go ahead. You need to get there. But you've got to be there at the right time. Y'all see how that works? Don't tell me you don't understand that because I know it works, right? <laughs> yeah. Or you're going down the highway and you're going a little bit too fast and you see the policeman on the side of the road. Ooh, I better slow down. It, that policeman was there because you need to slow down because now you need to get to your divine appointment at the right time. You see how this thing works? It works like that all the time. There's a book I read. It's called Street Level Prayer by a guy named Todd Volker. He's over in, in, uh, in uh, California, and he has this thing called free prayer, and he sets up these uh, like a canopy on the side of the road, and he has a big sign that says free prayer. People can stop by on the side, drop in, and get free prayer. Uh, he wrote that, and this is from the book. He says, God loves to show up and let people know he's real outside the church. Think about this. God loves to show up and let people know he's real. You're in crisis. God loves to show up in the middle of that crisis just so you'll know that God is real. 
And then it, it says, if we make ourselves available to God and we pray to be used by God, it just seems like we're at the right place at the right time. So here's my challenge, right? I want you to go ahead and make your resolution to read your Bible. I mean, that's a good one. Make your resolution, read your Bible every day. Spend some time with God in prayer. But then I want you to add this to it, okay? I will be intentional about making myself available to be assigned and used by God so that through me, God can show up and let somebody know that he's real. I will be intentional about making myself available to be assigned and used by God so that through, God, through me, God can show up and let somebody know that he is real. Let's pray. God, we thank you for all those times that you've shown up in our life.